Welcome to the conclusion of our two-part series on the drug education and counseling services. Let me first express our appreciation for those who took the time to view last week's documentary. Thank you also for your comments, your queries, and your suggestions. Remember last week we focused upon the origins of the drug education and counseling services as well as Second Chance, where we heard from the founder, Roger Husbands. You also got some insight as to our involvement, our partnership with the Drug Education and Counseling Services, where we heard from our own Sister Patricia Allen. This evening, we will focus on the other faces of the team, the administrative staff, the counselors, those who are involved in the day-to-day -day running of the Drug Education and Counseling Services. We will also get a look at some of the activities, barbering and carpentry. And I want you to keep an eye on a young lady in the barber shop. But before we get into this evening's presentation, let us just have a word of prayer. Father Lord in heaven, we thank you for your love and your faithfulness towards us. We thank you, dear God, for the opportunity that we can come to share, to share on aspects, dear God, of your will for our lives in terms of the drug education and counseling services and the work that it is doing in the community. I pray, dear God, that this week will be a blessing to the listeners and that your kingdom shall be established in the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, my name is Janelle Corbin. I am the Assistant Office Administrator here at Second Chance. What drove me to apply here at Second Chance is the initiative that Mr. Husbands had in that he is trying to assist the young people, whether it is educationally through skills or through CXCs. We aim to assist all young people. Um, most of our classes start from, our skill-based classes start from ages 11 and up. Well, CXC is for those geared toward the CXC. Like this year, CXC, we are aiming to bring in students who will be setting the CXC in May, June next year. Or if you are going into January 2025, then you could still come in and apply. Okay, what brought me to Second Chance Lessons was my cousin. My cousin was doing the English and Math CXC at the St. Lucie outlet. And he heard that Mr. Husbands needed an office administrator and I applied and I was fortunate enough to get in. He is also, he was also the um, head boy at the Corjian Pari School and he passed his exams and I am very pleased about that. A day in the life of an office administrator here at Second Chance, um, we do not open on Mondays. We open Tuesday to Friday 10 to 6 and Saturdays 9 to 5. The courses that we offer here are very reasonably priced. We do try to take into account how difficult it is right now financially for a lot of people. Uh, some we have some parents who have multiple students who would like to come here. So we try to work with them to make it easier for them to pay. If it is very, very difficult, you can always come to me and explain the situation to me. And I can work with you to get you to pay off your um, the balance. But whatever situation you may be going through, just know that our aim is to assist you in bettering your future, whether it be through skilled classes or through CXCs. From working with Second Chance Lessons and seeing the work that Drug Education and Counseling Services um, does here, as well because we operate from the same building, it has encouraged me to become more active with my son who's 13 after seeing the type of um, teenagers we have coming through our doors. Um, I would really like to go on to work with these young people some more. That is really my goal because I really want to understand and relate to my 13 year old son. Not being a boy, so I do not know what he is going through. I can try to understand but I believe that working with these young men here, especially the young men, it would give me greater knowledge and probably help assist with my relationship with my son. My name is Dion Hines. I am the office administrator here at Drug Education and Counseling Services. I've been here for over two years now. 
I started in 2021 here at Drug Education and Counseling. My face will be the first one you see when you enter. Um, I greet the clients. I um, assign them to their counselor. I would make appointments, um, set up for assessments. I send out reminders to all of our clients of their um, session the next day. Um, basically do the day-to-day -day runnings of the office. I would answer the telephone and pass messages on, check my email, um, basically <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. My name is Olivia Tate. Um, I'm a trainee in counseling psychology. I'm also a professional nurse, um, psychiatric nurse for the past 18 years. Um, I have chosen this profession because of my profession during my nursing career where I deal with a lot of young persons as well as adults um, in regards to issues mental health wise. So I decided that you know I want to do a bit more um, to help young persons and to navigate life and to assist them to get them where they need to be. Um, my role here as a counselor uh, has been very enlightening. Um, I have dealt with so many individuals, personalities, and attitudes. And the journey that have really brought me here is, as I said, through my career as a nurse. And with that career, that helps me also to, you know, to extend my knowledge from before on to, with my clients, especially persons that do come with anger management, substance abuse, you know, and as well as persons come with individual counseling with a different array of issues that they might be going through personally. So I'm able to, to amalgamate both what I have learned during my nursing career as a psychiatric nurse, and also what I have learned thus far in my counseling psychology courses, that to combine both of those experiences together to help, you know, empower my clients, to help provide the accurate care, and treatment needed for my clients um, to help them to empower their lives and to also function as well, you know, an all-rounded citizens for their country. From my experience um, at Drug Education Counseling Services, um, I have come into contact with both adults and children. And this could span from between the ages of 13 years old to up to 70 years old. Um, there's a rare of an array of challenges that persons come with. The young persons I have noticed, along with the adults, substance abuse problems, anger management problems, and it is posing a lot of challenge for them to overcome these issues. I have also noticed that these issues have stemmed from their childhood. Um, the association within the environment, within their family environment, of seeing these behaviors take place have impacted their lives um, coming up through um, from a childhood to adulthood. And it continues to impact them in a way that is so negative that they're having difficulty functioning. They're having difficulty, especially anger management, they're having difficulty to cope, you know, to relate to persons, to be able to communicate with persons effectively. In regards to substance use, um, a lot of them um, speak to marijuana use where, you know, they believe that marijuana is the, I guess, the cure for all for some persons, young persons believe in it as well as adults. And, you know, finding, I find it hard and challenging at times to really, you know, speak to those persons and let them know that, you know, um, substance abuse in regards to either alcohol, even marijuana use is detrimental to your health. Because as I said, I'm also in the field of healthcare. So I also, you know, psychoeducate them in regards to the consequences and the, the issues that will occur in using marijuana. Um, I have gotten, I'm, I'm, I'm slowly getting through to my clients 
where I apply certain approaches. There's an approach of, in regards to harm reduction, there's an approach where um, the, the goal is for abstinence, right? Um, so I work a lot with my clients to help them to see that reducing the amount of marijuana use is good for them. And not only good for them, but it helps them to think positively, it helps them to think accurately, um, it also helps us to function on a daily basis. And it has, it has at least impacted from what I have seen so far and the clients that I have encountered, it have impacted some clients that I have also encountered. And it has helped them in a tremendous way. They have been able to observe, you know, what I am saying and be able to say, well, look, you know, I need to deal with my issues, I need to deal with my problems, and that's what they're here for. The trials that I have faced um, in regards to my profession thus far, and throughout my training experience at the moment, is that, you know, I have, yes, lost some patients, and that is within my medical career. As I say, I'm a psychiatric nurse, and yes, I have counsel patients, where then, you know, you have tried, you have did everything that you know that you could do for them, and you have encouraged them the best way possible um, to have that hope to hold on to life. And yes, I have experience in counseling a person today or next week you hear that you know they're not here. And that have shocked me um, in so many ways to think and to sit down, not to blame myself, but to think, you know, what else I could have done, what else I could have instituted right and that sh helps me going forward that helps me that builds my mo my motivation that helps me going forward to plan ahead for other clients that i may encounter with the same issues and the same problems right and how to and look at it in a different perspective and maybe introduce something that i didn't introduce before to another client right um that's basically my trails my trails also now as a trainee psychologist you know some things Clients are very resistive to therapy. They, they, they know they come to the court and different organizations, which is referred here. But uh, when they come, you know, it's, it's, it's a resistive attitude. The behavior is a bit, you know, off guard in some things. But then, you know, for me as an individual, having that empathetic ear, being able to speak to them, as you know, I am human too, as you are. Don't mind, I'm sitting across from you and talking to you about what's going on with you. I too also go through my issues. I too have problems. And I also try to relate to them and what's going on with them, right? To help them open up, to help them feel comfortable in the session, to speak to me about what is going on. And when they've reached that point, there's so much that has that unfolds that really showed me, well, look, this is a lot going on and I really need to help this individual, right? Um, the triumphs, my triumphs, um, basically is that getting true to the individual, getting true to them in a, in a way that they are able to speak to me and feel comfortable. So I do like to uh, uh, help my patients to feel comfortable during the session, to make them feel, you know, that they are also, you know, welcomed they are not judged for nothing that they say. And to, you know, seeing that they're here, despite being sent here, try to address any issues that you would have had before that you want to deal with. You have the opportunity now, deal with them. Let us work through them together. So when you leave here, you'll be a better person. Your mindset will be better, you're able to function adequately within your society. Um, also, there's early warning signs that you, as an individual, as parents, as guardians, can, you know, look for in your children, your adolescents, um, as well as your young adults. Um, when it comes to anger management, you know, they become more irritable about small issues and small things. Um, sometimes they might sleep even longer, um, seeing that they're tired, you know, they're unable to do the things that they wanted to do or used to do before. They become on edge, um, they, you know, they shut down. Those type of things um, speaks to what they are going through. And also, you know, when you speak to them, they're very sharp. They're also, you know, not cognizant of these things. But you as parents and guardians can at least, you know, look and see what is going on with your children. Pay more attention, you know, be more cognizant of what 
they're feeling. And having that one-on-one -on -one conversation, I always tell my clients, uh, when adults come to me, uh, having that one-on-one -on -one, this conversation with your child on a daily basis. You know, good morning, good evening, how was your day? What went on throughout your day? Always have that one-on-one -on -one connection. Because I find that with children, they always speak to, you know, their parents don't really have that much connection with them. They don't feel comfortable sometimes, and you know, they can't always speak to their parents. Because you know, the parents are like working, being able to provide for their, their family, right? But then the child is left out emotionally and physically, right? So we need to address those things. In regards to adults, you know, some adults also become, in regards to aggression they become more irritable as well they become more angry about things that they wouldn't even bother about they themselves are not able to see these things but persons looking in were able to tell them well you have changed things are different in substance abuse you know persons then they become they become invasive they become start hiding things start being lying and telling lies that they know that trying to use the the, the substance trying to hide from, those, from, from others knowing that that's what they are actually doing, right? But less subtle behaviors and subtle verbal, you know, conversations can at least give you an idea of something is going on, what is happening with this individual, either child, adult, young adolescent, and, you know, just having that care, having that open mind to speak to them, to understand what's going on with them, it helps a lot. It helps an individual, even an individual on their dying bed, just to have that one person speak to them. It helps do, does a lot for them going forward. Personally, I believe as um, working with my clients and also as a nurse, having certain, having these agencies that speaks to addressing problems when it comes to young people, when it comes to adult substance abuse, anger management, um, Having these agencies in society, it helps the individual know that, you know, I have an outlet. I have an outlet where I could go. I have an outlet where I could address my feelings, my concerns, and, you know, not be judged. Um, they're able to navigate their world and navigate their environment in, in a better way. I know a lot of persons don't like therapy because the first thing that comes through their mouth, I don't want nobody in my business. But don't look at it as persons in your business because there's a Hippocratic oath we have to uphold confidentiality. Confidentiality is very important. And as a counselor going forward, confidentiality is a must. So you don't believe that persons out there spreading your business and talking about things that are going on in session it is not going on. We are only here to help. We are only here to make sure that you are well enough to function in society, to give back to your country, and to also be, be, be outstanding citizens, have families, you know, have friends, be happy. Because from my perspective, that's all life is about. Being happy, being comfortable, being satisfied, and doing what you love best. Hi, my name is Zoe Alsey, and at Drug Education and Counseling Services, I am a intern counseling psychologist. What that means is that I basically do counseling sessions as well as assessments and provide support to teenagers and young people who come here. So what led me to becoming a counseling psychologist was back in 2020, my brother died by suicide. And during that time, I was in my second year of completing my bachelor's degree in social work. And I felt like I needed that shift so it was sort of like a reflection period for me to say what more can i do because that feeling of when a family member so close to you takes their life it's different it's very 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 different it's like what more could i have done or what should i have done or what was i missing and i was riddled with those questions like what what was it that i was missing that i wasn't seeing so for me i felt like I need to make this career change and I need not anyone to feel this way, to feel the sadness that I felt. So I decided when I was done with my degree to try it out to see if I can become a psychologist. And I don't regret it, I will do it again in a heartbeat. So I have been here since September. What initially got me here was that part of my program 
my master's program we have to do internship in the second year and I happened to get placed at DCS which was at first so didn't something I was I, I didn't appreciate it at first but I wouldn't trade the experience for nothing I mean the two months here has been nothing short of amazing interacting with the young people with the teenagers it was challenging at first but I I'm loving it like it's making me want to work with children more so I am 23 years old and it is interesting because most times when the children come with their parents the parents watch me and I had ex an experience once where a lady came in for her daughter and then she said to me you're the counselor so it was a bit you know different because I guess she saw me as this young person trying to give her daughter support but also I see that my age is sort of like a benefit because the children are able to relate and feel more comfortable speaking to somebody in their age range so it's easier for me to understand where they're coming from because I wasn't a teenager too long ago so it's easier and I feel like they get more comfortable easy in terms of trials a lot of children who come here they're forced so that is the first thing. So that is the first step in resistance, being forced. So what you find a lot is that when they come, they normally say to me, I'm okay, I don't have a problem. The only reason I'm here is because my mother brought me here or I'm forced. So it's hard for them to kind of say what their problem is, especially if they don't see that they have a problem. So what I try to do is I try to get them comfortable. We speak about other things and then I try to slide in my techniques and what I need them to talk about during the session. And sometimes it works. Sometimes you have those who are really smart and they say to me, I see what you're trying to do. Or you're trying to say that I have an anger problem. Or you're trying to say that I have a substance abuse problem. But I feel like it goes back to like getting them comfortable enough to get deeper, right? Because a lot of them don't want to speak about their feelings or it's a case where a lot of them are not really aware of their feelings. So my trick is, we can talk, we can get you comfortable, but I'm going to try to slip in what I need to get you to say or get you to, you know, figure this out together. What it is that I normally do in sessions is that I try to get the clients to speak a little, a little bit about themselves. What is it that they like to do? What is it they like to watch? What is it that they're interested in? So when we get to the basis of that, then I would ask them a question relating back to why they're here, right? Also, I usually come with worksheets and I find worksheets help them, especially those who are not really want, wanting to speak. The worksheets help them kind of write down their problems or get them a little comfortable because sometimes if, they're, if they, they don't really want to talk or sometimes they don't really know what to say. So I feel like the worksheets help. If I'm, also, if I'm doing anger management and I'm coming with triggers, then I come with a worksheet on triggers and then we work through it and then we can speak about it. So I feel like the worksheet is sort of like a guide to get them to where they need to be. But the main thing is getting them comfortable. I think that's very important, getting them comfortable. In terms of what I've seen thus far dealing with substance abuse and anger management, a lot of it goes back to the environment that children are in. Right. So if they're coming here and they're learning all these techniques and we're giving them enough support that they need, if they go back home and they're not getting that support or their parents aren't pushing them, it's very easy for them to kind of relapse or go back. So it is very important that as parents, we try to provide the environment that they need for them to flourish. But also, let's go to anger management. A lot of the times people come with anger problems, but there are underlying feelings. And what I realized that a common underlying feeling is hurt and frustration. A lot of children come with a lot of hurt of not being heard by the adults around them or not feeling seen. So they react in an angry way. So it's not necessarily that they have an anger problem, but there are deep hidden issues or feelings that they have. So in order for them to get it out, they just react aggressively. So with that, we try to get to or deal with the underlying issues. If you hurt, what is hurting you? If you're feeling frustrated, what is frustrating you? And how we can deal with that, thus helping you deal with your anger problem. Evening, my name is Valencia Oliver Campbell, and I am one of the English facilitators here at Second Chance. 
I've been teaching here for about six years and I was encouraged and enthusiastic about coming because I like the philosophy, I like the concept, I like the idea of providing a second chance for persons who might have, you know, not have done so well in school, but now they're a bit more mature. Um, they're, they understand the value of education and I like the idea of providing a second chance for these persons. My experience here has been pretty rewarding. Um, of course, you would meet some students who still do not understand that, you know, the, the value of education and you're providing a second chance for them. But the majority of the students um, take the opportunity and they grasp it um, with both hands. And I, I had a really rewarding experience once when a student was, you know, she came through the class, she was very enthusiastic. Um, and when she got back her results, she didn't just call me to tell me what her results, but she actually took a photo of the results from the CXC website. And she called me and she said, ma'am, this is what I got. And there was also another student. Um, she came through the, the program as well. And then she sent her daughter you know, she sent her daughter to be part of the program. That, that student was successful. So it, 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 it's, it's rewarding. Of course, you would wish that some of the students would, you know, take it a little bit more seriously. But for the most part, for the most part, the students are, they like the opportunity of having another opportunity. And, 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 and they accept, you know, that, that they can do better and they do better, so it, it's been, as I said, rewarding for the most part. But I would also want to encourage those students who, you know, come in to, to, to really give it their all because it can be a good experience for them, it can be rewarding for them. And, you know, that, that's what I would hope for the program. But so far, it's been, it's been to me, a good journey. All right, as I, I would like to leave um, a quote from we all know Nelson Mandela, and there was something that he said, which to me is a very powerful quotation, and it talks about education. It says that education is the most powerful weapon that you can use to change the world. And, you know, that is something that I would want to leave with students. That is something that I would want to leave with parents, that with education, you have the power to change the world. So, um, my name is Rico Antoine. I'm a counseling psychologist. Um, I actually became a counseling psychologist through, through completing my master's at the University of West Indies, KFL campus. Um, I have been conducting sessions at drug education and counseling for probably over a year now. Um, funny enough, I was introduced to this, to this um, organization through a friend that I was, um, was in my class at UE. So you know how people say sometimes that um, you don't really meet friends and meet and have opportunities when you go to school, but actually that friend, meeting that friend became an opportunity for me and helping me to be able to help others when they become a counselor at Dry Education and Counseling. Um, it has been a really, really good experience so far. Um, I think I've been able to, you know, help children, and not only help children, but help parents and families in general because necessarily not most of the time when you you know when you meet a child sometimes when you have a constant session with a child you actually realize that not only the child is you know going through some significant challenges but it may be a parent it may be a family member and I'm, I am grateful to be to be given an opportunity to help to help others because I like to give right um, I'm also thankful for Mr. Husbands for giving me that opportunity and also all the, all the future aspirations or future goals that will be implemented in the organization. Um, I would say that counseling has been, it's been, it has been a tough process so far. I have, been, I have been a trained counseling psychologist for over two years. Um, I really like the, the, the job. The, um, the profession. 
it is a profession that you really have to have a love for children and a love for others. I would say that if you don't, you know, to have empathy for others is not a profession that I would advise you to, to be in because sometimes you have to give of yourself more of um, yourself to others within this prof uh, profession because people actually need it, right? Um, I would say that with counseling too is not a is not a is not a like a, a quick fix. Right? When you meet a client, there's so many, for example, a child. Um, a child may be going through so much experiences within the environment, within the home environment from a young age. And then when you, when you actually get to meet them in secondary school, uh, it's, it's difficult to basically help them to change all of the challenges that they would have experienced, that they would have encountered in their environment from primary school. So getting them to change all of those things in secondary school can be a, a big challenge as for a counselor. But with the help, once a child um, wants to put in the effort, with the help also of a parent, a family member, it's very, very important that you get that overall, that, that community spirit to be able to help the child because that's the main goal of helping the child. And the same, the same way of counseling that I would that I would execute here at Joe Education and Counseling. I try to execute in my job because I am too a secondary school counselor at um, two of the secondary schools in Barbados. All right, so the same job that I would try to, to do here, I try to execute at, in, my, in my secondary schools that I am placed at. So as I was saying just now, um, counseling is a, is a long process. For example, if you have a child who, who, who I'm doing anger management sessions with, all right, um, and I have, and I want to get him to a place where he has to control his reactions, control his behavior, how he respond to others. I have to get him to a point where he acknowledges and takes responsibility of how his anger is. First of all, so he has to acknowledge, you know, how he does be when he's angry. What's his triggers of anger, and then when he understands what is his triggers, this is where we can practice problem solving skills where it can help him to think before he reacts. Think about the consequences of your behavior when you are going to you know, make a statement or when you are going to showcase a certain behavior and how it will affect you not only in the present, but how it will affect you in the future. And I find that that is a major challenge with most children right now. Um, most children just think about the present, think about, you know, um, if I do something, how it will affect me now, but they don't think about the long run. And most adults will share with you, um, children, that that is one of the major mistakes that they would have made as a teenager. They would have just thought about the present and not thought about, if I do something today, how it can affect me five, 10 years, 15 years down the line. So it's very, very important that before you make a decision, whatever it is that, that you think um, that you're not, that you're struggling with. It could be schoolwork, it could be somebody that, that you and them don't get along, whatever you're struggling with. It's important before you make a decision, think, think about the consequences of your behavior, think about how it can not only affect you, but also affect you know, your close people around you, your family members, and also your friends as well. Right? And the overall aspect of benefiting the child it's very important that in order for the child to change as well, that you have that support from parents. It's very important that once you're given that support from parents, um, not only physically, but mentally, spiritually as well, the child will be able to make a greater effort to change their behaviors and also their, the mental side of that child. So in an overall, counseling, counseling therapy, basically for a child. The parent will be invited in the intake session and personal information like family history, um, birth history, the sports that the child, li that the child likes, um, how is the environment at home will be discussed in the intake session. And for example, before the termination of therapy, it's important that the parent 
that the, that the counselor. So I would be I would basically get the parent to come into a session and to to speak to the counselor with the child present to find out how the environment at home is 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 continuing to improve to get that overall that overall goal to help the family function better and when the family is functioning better as well the child will be able to be function better as well um, in a holistic aspect the joy the joy of coming weekly is one that really you know you can't really put into words i would say that my coming in, as I was mentioning before, coming into counseling, you have to have empathy, you have to have a love for others. And that's the major reason that it keeps me coming back because when at the end of termination of a, of a client, I could feel um, happy that I'd be able to help that person in some way. I want, there, there are some, there, you know, there are some students when they came into counseling, the face, when they, when they opened the door, the face was pushed up on the outside. And they, and they say, young boy, what your, your face look so? And what your, your looks so vets? And then the face that I get, let's say in the seventh, or necessarily not even the seventh, but the second and third session with that young person, that young boy, it, it shows me that you know, some children, they need someone to talk to. They need someone to guide them. And I love the fact that I can be there to help them, you know, and talk to them, help them to get things off their chest, help them to think about the decisions that they're making and, and also how it can impact them now and also in the future. So that joy of being able to, to speak to them and that joy of seeing their face and their faces, their face, the, the excitement on their face improve and also their body language. Because you know your body language says a lot. When 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 I saw them in the intake session, they look angry, they look sad, and then when I eat from the second, the third session straight on to termination and they look happy, that basically brings me excitement. In terms of the community, um, everyday living, I think we need to get back to that, you know, that community culture. If you see a young male doing something on the street that, that is not correct, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with an adult speaking to them and talking to them, them, addressing them about the behaviors that they're showcasing. Because if a stranger, if an adult could, could see it and address them with it and they listen and understand, it means that we'll have that, you know, that community spirit, again, where children can un children be able to develop better habits, basically. Um, I think that parents, um, family members, also friends need to play a vital, vital role in a child's life um, from birth straight up to even when they're adults. Um, whether it's whether it's by whether it's not if it's not financially, whether it's by um, physically, mentally, um, psychologically, it's important that you know you you understand the the benefits of being there for for that child and only not your children but also other children, so that they too can grow up to be you know b basically young good women and and men in society. Because they are the future for our Barbados. They are the ones that will be making the decisions five, ten years from now on. They're, they're these children that we have now, some will be politicians, some will be doctors, some will be drivers, vamen, conductors, you know, um, tellers in a bank. So it's important that we as a society, um, we try to train these children to develop positive and good habits starting from young and that's something that's very you know it's very um painful to see right now that you know most young children they don't have a lot they have some there's a there's a very not a very few but there's a lot of children that have good habits but then there's another few that you know has, that started to develop a lot of negative habits and there's I don't I don't observe for myself and see people speaking to them, and then do too when people do speak to them, you know the children don't have a tendency to listen. So 
not only do, does parents, um, caregivers have to play a role, but children as well, you also have to play a role in that when someone speaks to you who may not be a family member or be a, or be a parent, that you listen as well and take in the information that they're speaking to you about. And um, boys, I think that, you know, you have a vital, vital role as a young man to play in society. You will be um, a father one day, one day you will also be a grandfather. So it's important that, that you understand the purpose of your life. And that will start basically from you, from a young age when you're going to primary school, and you finish primary school, you go to secondary school, you want to go to secondary school, be able to learn something at school. You want that when you get home on the evening, or when you finish school for the term, you could say, yes, I learned, I learned something today. It doesn't make sense that you go to school every day and you, don't, you tell yourself that when you get home, well, I didn't learn nothing today. I can't remember what the teacher said. So it's important that it starts from primary school, goes into secondary school, and then it goes to tertiary. Or if, if you don't, if, if you're not given the opportunity to go to tertiary, you know, you go to polytechnic or you go to another institution that will be able to help you build life skills. And with these life skills, will help you to basically have a future for your life and also have a purpose for your life because that's the general reason, that's the general, you know, the general reason for you to be here in, on earth, for you to have a purpose, for you to live your life abundantly and also positively. So young men, it's important that you live your life, respect yourself, also respect others and live your life with a purpose and have value for yourself. My name is uh, Herbert Anthony Angus. I am, well, I'm not really a born Barbadian, but I came here and get into the old carpentry skills, working with a company. And from there on, you know, I was very into the building drying kind of stuff. So I was more job related towards the drying, interested in reading the building drying and so on. So from day on, I started to fall in love with it and then my boss just pushed me towards the old carpentry thing and I was dead on. So from there on now I started to work with another company and move on work with another company and then the I used to do like multiple work as in carpentry I would do a little tiling I do a little painting and I was that until I find it comfortable I step out on my own. So in that way I have my own business now where I do contractor work and the way I um, get into working for myself so one of my clients would have known Roger and the way he put me onto Roger to come and did something for him on the back but after that I was keep doing all the most of the maintenance in the building and Roger would have come to me and asked me um, if I could willing to do um, a cabinetry class for him. At first I turned it down <laughs> because I said Roger I was be too busy and I'm not sure if it's something I could do let me think about it but I never get back to him but then he come to me with it again and I said okay if I do come I only could be in the evening which is from 3 30 to 5. And from the on, it was head on. Everything was good. <laughs> yeah. So my first thing when I came here, my intention was to go towards accounting. So I was every, you know, all my classes I attend, I just want to get into it. So my intention was to go straight to get my ACCA. And then I said to myself, you know what? I'm in this field. I should be able to know something good, you know? And I said, look, I put a pause on it, on my accounting class, and I said, let me just focus on, elevate myself more into the cabinetry, carpentry skills. And they were, I said, okay, I'm gonna go with it. But by doing that now, I like, I just completely forget everything about the accounting, but it helps in so many different ways because even though you may have some kind of degree or anything to that level. 
you'll be able to know to do some kind of cabinetry making or carpentry skills or something to that to that level of work I should say you know but other than that is is pretty good my experience in teaching the class I should say I would say it's fun let me just say that first I mean when I see my students I just I just smile <laughs> because I know when they come it'll be an exciting event or it's an exciting class that we can have um the only challenges I have is um is where most people trying to learn to read the tape and that's something I tend to spend a lot more time on is let it understand the different measurement on the tape but other than that I mean the experience is good the young people they are willing the older folks is you know is willing as well and everything is just going good so it's all every Saturday is fun <laughs> one of my students I should say um, were very interesting in the overall getting to know the full knowledge about cabinetry making um, he were more um, into the making the draws you want to know um, what's going there what the measurement if this happened and if that happened what could be the outcome of it um, if you inbuild the draw the right way what could be caused by that if the cabinet is not square what could be the issue of that what could be the problem so there way I come to me one side he said um, Angus I will I will I will really like to know a lot more about this and I would like for you to like teach me a little bit more I know these are just the basic but I would like to know more so I told him I said listen I will willing to teach you more about this class but um, it only can be happen during the week. I could bring you along with me when I'm working, show you my experience in building cabinetry, closets, you know, all those kind of stuff, and then you'll be able to learn more. But until then, I mean, I will be able to work within my class, and if there's any question you want to ask, just ask me. Again, I must say, what insightful thoughts from this presentation. I pray that your heart will be stimulated to the point that you would want to contribute towards the well-being of this nation's young people through the drug education and counseling services and second chance. If that is you, I invite you to contact the office or you can reach out to us here at the People's Cathedral 429-2145 and we will make the necessary contact for you. I pray, dear God, that you will continue to offer prayer for our nation's young people because there is hope, there is a way. And we thank 
those at the drug education and counseling services for making opportunities available for our young people. Let's just conclude in prayer. We thank you, Lord, this evening for all that has been shared. We pray, dear God, that you will continue to be a source of blessing and encouragement for the staff and those students at the Drug Education and Counseling Services. I pray, dear God, that you will touch the hearts of those who viewed the presentation over the last two weeks and that they will want to contribute in some way, Father Lord, as we seek to advance the work of the kingdom in the earth. So to you, Lord, we give the honor. To you, we give the glory. And to you, we give the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for viewing and see you next week Sunday.